Hi, I'm Stephen with AlbertaUrbanGarden.ca. In the Testing Garden Assumptions series, I put garden practices, products, and methods to the test using the scientific method and peer-reviewed research. I do this because I wanted to learn if the products and practices that I was implementing in my own garden were supported by science. And I have since branched out to other methods and, and products that simply interested me to investigate. The reason I really do this, especially on YouTube, is to reach you, the viewers, and to provide you guys with evidence so that you can combine that with your experience as gardeners and make well-informed decisions in your own garden. The opinions that I sometimes provide as a part of these videos is simply a combination of my background as a professional biologist and my many years of gardening. What I really hope to culture here on YouTube and on my Facebook page is a community that can enter into scientific discussions in a respectful manner. This highlights one of my favorite parts about science, the fact that it is a big self-correcting beast and through these conversations we're able to collectively increase our knowledge about gardening. And this is especially important as your peer review on my videos and the videos of other gardening content creators on YouTube will help advance the science and the knowledge base of the worldwide gardening community. Today I'm going to evaluate one of the methods that I have promoted in the past on my channel. Worm castings are said to be a fertilizer, improve soil structure, and add plant growth hormone and humic acid. For centuries, people have known that adding organic material to soil improves its ability to grow food. Worm castings are no different, however, they do have one immediate benefit that other organic materials may not. The worms themselves, as they work through the soil, will naturally till the soil. This helps air and water infiltrate, which benefits your plants. Next, let's take a look at the fertilizer potential of worm castings. The nutrient content of those worm castings is highly dependent on what you feed your worms. In order to understand this a little better, let's step back a little bit and take a look at the resources that you can generate in your house or in your yard that you could use to feed your worms and make those castings. I've evaluated in this series resources like leaves and wood chips that you can find in your yard, and kitchen scraps like coffee grounds, eggshells, and banana peels. All of these resources have fertilizer potential. If you feed those resources to your worms, the nutrients contained within them will be incorporated into the castings as the worms process them. I've included a couple of examples of the potential nutrient content of worm castings in the description below. Now that we've established worm castings have a fertilizer potential, is there any criticisms? Often when evaluating the individual resources, people comment that the concentration of some nutrients are very low. And that is absolutely correct. When I report the concentration of nutrients, it's often in a unit of measurement like milligrams per liter. If you are adding a resource like banana peels to your compost, one milliliter won't add a significant amount of nutrients. However, over time, as you add peel upon peel, those nutrients will build. The process of vermicompost takes a large initial volume and reduces it in size by between 40 and 60%. In essence, taking all the nutrients from the material that you fed your worms and consolidating and condensing it down to a smaller volume. So if you use the same unit of measurement, you're essentially increasing the concentration of those nutrients by between 40 and 60 percent. Another added benefit is instead of sending these resources to landfill where they will effectively remove the nutrients from the nutrient cycle, you're recycling them in place and that is helping you grow more food for your family. So vermicompost has the potential to contain all 18 of the mineral elements required or that are beneficial for plant growth. So my next natural question is, what is the pH of the finished worm castings? pH is important because nutrients in soil are only available to plants within a certain range. If the soil is too basic or acidic, the nutrients are either locked out or bind into forms that the plant is not able to access. The optimal range for soil pH for most plants is between 7.0 and 5.5. Most papers that evaluate worm castings for a variety of reasons also track the pH over time. Worm castings almost always have a neutral pH within 60 days. The worms and bacteria neutralize any basic or acidic materials such as banana peels and coffee grounds respectively. This process also happens in traditional compost, however it takes a bit longer. So worm castings can have a full complement of nutrients largely dependent on what you feed them. And through the process of making the worm castings, everything is neutralized down to a pH that is in the optimal range for plant growth. 
let's move on to the claims made about plant growth hormones and humic acid. Humic acid is the result of the decay of organic material releasing acids that are all classified as humic acids. Researchers at the Ohio State University established a positive effect on plant growth when in the presence of humic acid. As worms are essentially responsible for the breakdown of organic material as their food source, their castings do contain high concentrations of humic acid. Plant growth hormone is a little simpler to explain. There are hormones in the soil that have a positive effect on plant growth. There are numerous studies that have established that composting your kitchen scraps in a vermicompost will produce castings that are extremely rich in plant growth hormone and humic acid. So it would appear that the main claims made about worm castings are in fact supported by peer reviewed literature. There are two simple ways that you can make worm castings at home. The first is a worm bin and the second is in place. Worm bins can be very complex or very simple. But essentially, worms only need a couple of things in order to do their jobs. The first is some bedding material, some moisture, grit, a source of food that's in the green column, and a source of food that's in the brown column. Provide the worms with a bed of slightly moist potting soil with a layer of leaves or shredded paper on top. When you have kitchen scraps to feed them, simply pull back the mulch layer and place the food on top of the potting soil. Eggshells are not only a great source of nutrients, but when crushed up fine enough, they provide worms with the grit that help them digest other food sources. You have now provided them with what they need to make rich worm castings. Worm bins are great, especially if you don't have a lot of space, and they're ideal for people who grow in containers on patios or balconies. I like to make my worm castings right in the garden. I simply lay the material I want to become worm castings on the surface of the garden soil and let the native worms break down the material. The benefit of this is the castings are deposited in place while the worms move through the soil. They also ensure it is well aerated, further helping benefit the plants. In addition, this mulch method requires less time. There are plenty of different species of worms out there, and the species of worm that you're working with will impact the quality of the worm castings that you get and the speed at which you can harvest them. Native worms often eat less when compared to composting worms and reproduce at a slower rate. However, those composting worms likely don't overwinter in my area, making the native ones a little easier for me to deal with. Composting worms, like red wigglers, are able to eat a high volume compared to their body weight and produce castings that release more nutrients faster than when compared to a native earthworm. Now that you have some worm castings, where is the best place to apply this resource in your garden? My favorite place to use worm castings is in the potting mix that I use to start my seedlings and my container garden. Unlike my main garden bed that has a large enough volume to create a healthy nutrient cycle, containers and pots don't have enough volume. This makes it difficult to get the organic material to release their nutrients within. Vermicompost releases plant available nutrients much quicker and when used in my seed starting mix or my container garden often contains enough plant available nutrients that I don't need to find an external source of fertilizer throughout the growing season. When planting in the spring I do like to place a handful of worm castings underneath the seedlings. Transplanting is very stressful on the plants and the immediate availability of plant available nutrients, humic acid and plant growth hormone help ease that stress. In addition, another small benefit, at least for a short while, is those composting worms that are contained within the vermicompost can work on your mulch layer, helping to accelerate the production of in-place vermicompost. Worms are one of the organisms that help run the nutrient cycle in the soil, turning things that would otherwise be trash into nutrients for your plants that in turn feed you. So in summary, worm castings do live up to their claims of being an organic fertilizer, improving soil structure, and containing humic acid and plant growth hormones, all of which benefit our garden plants. And the best part is, is you can produce worm castings, whether it's inside or directly in the garden, for very little cost and very little effort. I will continue to use worm castings to turn trash from my kitchen into free soil amendments that helps me save money and produce more food for my family.